1 John chapter 3, verses 10 through 16. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death into life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel, for the scripture reading, and Brother Philip for the good prayer, and Brother Ralph for leading these songs for us. And today, uh, it's good to be here, and we're thankful to have the good number. Uh, we're sorry that Sister Karen Lee Stepp is not able to be here today. Sister Janice and Sister Sharon have informed us that she's having trouble breathing, serious problems, and she has a new pacemaker and feels that something is not right there. So she may have to go to the hospital, so let's please keep Sister Carolyn in our prayers. We miss her being here today and want to pray for her and all of her family. Today, as you can see on the bulletin, we have a brief outline there of our lesson on Cain and Abel. In Cain and Abel, we learn some very important things. We learn a contrast between brethren in attitude, character, and philosophy of life. In Cain, whose name means acquired, we read in Genesis 4 and verse 1, And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Eve acquired a child, a man-child, from the Lord. Have you ever thought about the fact that Cain was the first person ever brought into this world through natural conception and the bearing by his mother into the world? Adam and Eve were created full grown by God. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, Genesis 2 and verse number 7. So he was the first person brought into the world by the God-given reproductive process between a husband and a wife. And then in the next verse, we read of the birth of Abel, verse number 2. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. These two boys had different occupations, two interests in making a living, as Cain was a tiller of the ground, and uh, Abel was a keeper of the sheep. But there's certainly nothing wrong with either one of those professions. Those were both honorable professions. But we read of the birth of Abel here, whose name means breath. When children are born into the world, they bring such blessing and a joy. Children are a heritage of the Lord, Psalm 127, 3 declares. Yet some children grow up to be a heartache, like Cain did. No doubt Abel was a joy to his mother and father. He was a righteous person. But Cain, on the other hand, brought great heartache to his family. We know that children can be brought up in the same home, under the same teaching, under the same parents, and yet be very, very different just like Cain and Abel, were very different. They were different in character, in attitude, and philosophy of life. We know that some children continue on to be a great blessing and joy to their parents, but then others rebel. Over in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord himself used this illustration. 
Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Jehovah God, as great a father as he is and was, he brought up children, referring to Israel, but they rebelled against him. He brought them up and he nourished them, but yet they still rebel. But now let's get further into the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, verses 1 to 12. We notice that they both brought an offering to the Lord. But God had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, as we read here in verses 3 to 5. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. God had respect and regard to the offering that Abel brought, but he did not accept the offering brought by Cain, and Cain was very angry about this. Instead of being angry at himself or saying, I should have done better, I should have done right, evidently he had anger toward his brother Abel, and perhaps even toward God himself. We see his reaction. He was very wroth, he was very angry, and his countenance fell. Then God poses three questions to Cain, as we read here in verses 6 and 7. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? In other words, why are you angry? Why should you be angry? You knew what was right. You had that opportunity, just like your brother. In other words, he doesn't say that, but why should you be angry? And then secondly, he asked, and uh, why is thy countenance fallen? Why is your countenance fallen? And then thirdly, if thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? You again have the opportunity to do well, to do right, and to be accepted by me, the Lord God is saying. You have that opportunity. And why would he not want to take that opportunity and do what was right and be accepted by God. And he said, And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. When we do not do right, we do not do well, sin lies at the door. Sin lay at the door for Cain. And he did sin, because he did not do well, as we shall see, not only in the offering, but in other matters. You have the opportunity to do right, God is saying. Is he not saying that to us today? We have the opportunity to do right. We should not be angry at our family, our society. I know that we're angry about sin sometimes, just like God is, and we should be angry and have righteous indignation against evil, such as the shedding of innocent blood and abortion and other evils in our society. But we should not be angry against God. We shouldn't blame everyone else for our problems and be angry because we have done wrong. But in the second place, we see that Cain was not accepted because his religion was not acceptable to God. This is how important religion is. God did not have respect to Cain and to his offering. He did not accept Cain because he did not offer proper religion unto God. Evidently, Cain's offering was not according to God's commandment, and we know that it's implied here that it was not according to God's commandment. We remember what Samuel said to King Saul when he sinned in 1 Samuel 15, 22. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. God calls for obedience. We note that God's wrath is upon the children of disobedience, as Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, 6 the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. When people disobey God, they do not listen to, not, to God and do His will. God's wrath is against them. Someone might say, though, that Cain at least was religious to a degree. 
At least he did bring an offering to God. Maybe he was sincere. I believe the text implies, though, that Cain was not really sincere and honest in what he did. We know that what he did was not right because God did not accept it. People will often make excuses. Well, we can just offer in religion what pleases us or what we want to do. People in religion today want to offer things that suits them. We know that Cain evidently was very presumptuous. He presumed that he could just bring to God what he wanted to. They didn't have to do it exactly the way that God said to do it. This time I would like to look at three kinds of religion and worship that are not acceptable to God. These are in the New Testament. And then, of course, we will look at the one kind of worship that is acceptable. Briefly here, worship that is according to the doctrines and commandments of men is not acceptable to God. In Matthew 15 and verse 9, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Jesus here is speaking of the Jews. Whenever people worship according to the doctrines and commandments of men, it cannot be acceptable to God. We have examples today in the worship, such as mechanical instrumental music, we have special singing groups. We have female preachers and teachers and those trying to set them up as leaders in the church. We have the offering of incense and many other things that are done in religion in the worship that God is not pleased with. But then secondly, we have ignorant worship. In Acts 17, verse 23, Paul went to the educational center of the ancient world, Athens, Greece. These people were very learned and educated, but yet they were ignorant of God's way. Of God, Paul said to them, Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. So people may be highly educated and well informed in this world, but yet be ignorant of what is right in the eyes of God. Today there are people who are worshiping in ignorance throughout the world. They are doing things that would seem ridiculous to us and are in a sense, but they are very, uh, it's a very sad situation because they're not acceptable to God. They are doing things that are displeasing to the Lord in ignorance. But then there's a third kind of worship that is not approved and that's found in Colossians, the second chapter, and verse number 23. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will, worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. I believe this is an important thing to step aside and look at for a moment. There were people in the church who were making the law regarding meat that had been offered to idols. And we know that that meat in and of itself was not contaminated. It was not sinful. They would offer it to idols and then put it in the marketplace for sale. And people would come and buy that meat. It's perfectly wholesome meat. But yet it had been offered to idols. And some had a guilty conscience about eating such meat. And Paul taught on that, that if you have a doubt, then you should not eat of it. But there were those that were trying to make a law about this. They said, touch not, taste not, handle not, verse 21. They made a law that God did not make. And Paul refers to this as will worship. He said in verse 22, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So here we have three kinds of worship that are not acceptable to God. That which is according to the commandments of men, Matthew 15, 9. Will worship, Colossians 2, 23. And worship in ignorance, Acts 17, verse 23. There is only one kind of worship that God will accept, and that is laid out by Jesus to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4, 24. When he said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We have three things here that constitute rightful worship. Number one, worshiping the right being, the true and living God. Secondly, to worship in spirit, that is, from the inward man, sincerely from the heart. And then in truth, that is according to the truth of God's Word. Those three elements must be present in worship in order for our worship to be acceptable unto God. 
In Colossians 3.17, Paul said, And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. The name of the Lord Jesus there means by the authority of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, which we know, according to Matthew 28, verse 18, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, my friends, today, as we consider these matters, let us look at the third place. Abel's worship was acceptable to God. Why was his worship acceptable to God? To God. Let's turn now to the book of Hebrews and the 11th chapter. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn over there to Hebrews chapter 11. And this is where we have a list of people that the writer mentions who by faith did various things. That means they did these things by faith in God and according to his will. One of the characters mentioned here is Abel in Hebrews 11 and verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now evidently uh, Abel did not live a very long life because his brother Cain rose up and slew him, as Daniel read in the scripture reading a while ago, and as we will read here shortly in Genesis 4. But yet, his influence lives on. You know, that reminds us of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus Christ only lived to be in his early 30s on this earth. But yet, the most influential person who has ever lived, and a great and godly influence he was, in fact, we are to follow his example and in his footsteps, 1 Peter 2, verse 21. No one can begin to equal the amount of good that our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, did for mankind and even for us today. We know that. But he only lived a short life. Now, we do have some godly characters in the Bible who lived a long life and a faithful and fruitful life. But then we have others that lived a short life. But still, they were very faithful and fruitful, such as Abel here. He being dead, yet speaketh. He speaks to us even today by his godly example and influence. Though he did not live a very long life, he has a great influence even on today. today. We do not know really how long Cain lived, to my knowledge. We do not know how long he lived. I was searching for that yesterday, did not find how long he lived. Uh, but Cain evidently lived a much longer life. But he goes down in infamy as a poor example. One that we are not to follow when you look at Cain. So one may live a very long life, but yet that life amount to nothing really as far as good is concerned in serving God. Or one may live a very short life and do great and much good upon this earth. It depends on whether we are obedient to God or not, whether we are acceptable unto him. We know that Abel's offering was by faith. Now that expression, by faith, the short expression, says a great deal to us. It indicates that what Abel did was according to God's word. Because faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Whenever we do something according to God's word, with faith in him, it is by faith that we do it. We cannot do anything unscriptural by faith. As much as we might believe in our hearts that it's the right thing to do, it's still not by faith. We recall how that Paul concludes the 14th chapter of Romans saying that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So whenever we do something that is not of faith, that is according to God's word and by faith in him, then it is sinful. That's why Cain's worship was not acceptable. His offering was not accepted by God. But now as we look here, in Genesis 4, verse 4, the Bible says, Then the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. He offered in a manner that was given 
by God. Here we learn a great principle that's all throughout the Bible, and that is obedience, the principle of obedience. Jesus taught that in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. In giving the great commission of Matthew 28, 20, Jesus concludes here, ending the book of Matthew, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Jesus speaks of obedience out of love in John 14, 15, when he said, If you love me, keep my commandments. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verses 8 and 9, Though he were a son, referring to Christ, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. But now, my friends, Abel is called a righteous person. He is called righteous here in Hebrews 11 and verse 4, as we just read. But he is also referred to as being righteous in the book of Matthew, the 23rd chapter, and verse number 35. Here Jesus Christ speaks of righteous Abel, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon, all, upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew, between the temple and the altar. In the same context, Jesus refers to Abel in Luke 11, verse 51. But here he refers to him as righteous, Abel. Now why would Abel be referred to as a righteous person? Well, 1 John 3 and verse 7 tells us, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. This is the reason that Abel was righteous. He did God's will. He did what he did according to faith by obeying the commandments of the Lord. Now in the fourth place today, Cain rose up and slew his brother Abel. Let's now begin at verse number 8 in Genesis 4. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. Let's pause there for a moment. Cain had bitterness and resentment toward Abel his brother, and perhaps even envy. You know that the Jews delivered Jesus to be crucified, and even old Pilate knew that, according to Matthew 27, verse 18, because of envy. They envied our Lord. Evidently, Cain envied Abel. He resented him, hatred and resentment. And thus he rose up and slew him. But God saw everything that was done. And in verse number 9, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? This again tells us something about the man Cain, his attitude. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Was he really being honest with God? We know that Abel was in the place where Cain slew him unless Cain was the one that moved his body. Was he really being honest? And then look at his attitude. Am I my brother's keeper? That's not the attitude of love that the Lord teaches us that we are to have. That we are to be concerned about our brother and our neighbor and to care for them. God's question and Abel's answer indicates the kind of person excuse me, uh, Cain's answer, indicates the kind of person that Cain was. And then in verse number 10, he said to Cain, God did, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. That teaches us that when blood is shed, God knows it and he recognizes it. Think about all the innocent blood of infants that have been shed throughout the ages and even in our society today in the act of abortion. Think about innocent people who have been killed, and God hears the cry of that innocent blood. Isn't that a powerful cry? Indeed it is. God placed a curse upon Cain, as we read in verses 11 and 12. 
And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. My friends, we say that sin always brings a curse. Let us remember that. The joy and happiness and blessing do not come as a result of sin. We know that because of sin, man dies spiritually, and even physical death has come to the world because of sin. But consider what Paul said in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let's look at a few lessons before we close this morning. Those like Cain are not of God, but are of the devil. We know here in uh, 1 John chapter 3 that we read from earlier, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. But look at the previous verse, 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So if we do not do God's will and we do not do right, which means that we do not do righteousness and we fail to have love for others, then we are not of God. Evidently, Cain, uh, Abel, was one who did have love for others. We know that he loved God because he obeyed him. But Cain did not have such a love. In the next chapter of the book of 1 John is a great statement regarding love beginning at verse 7. The apostle said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. We learn here that true love brings forth action, as it did on the part of God, certainly it does on our part also. In verse 11, John goes on to say, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And how true this is. Cain was of the wicked one, just as the apostle writes in 1 John 3. We know that the devil was a murderer from the beginning, according to John 8, verse 44. We should not follow in the way of Cain. Jude speaks of those in the way of Cain in Jude, verse 11. I'd like to turn over there and read that for a moment. Warning about those that Jude is writing to the brethren about. These false teachers, woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. Evidently here was a group of people who were presumptuous, self-willed, selfish, doing their will rather than God's will. We read of them in verse number 8 of Jude. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, that is authority. They didn't like authority. And speak evil of dignities. When you shed the blood of another, Brother Leroy Brownlow writes, when you shed the blood of another in reputation, influence, usefulness, or in any other way, it will cry unto the Lord against you. End of quote. That was a good quote, and how true that is. Now I would like to turn together with you to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse number 24. Here in Hebrews 12, verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Here he is referring to the blood of Jesus Christ. It speaketh better things. The blood of Christ cries out unto God, enabling us to escape sin and death and to be justified. Justified by His blood, Romans 5, verse 9. How great and powerful is the cry of the blood of Christ before our Heavenly Father. Abel, like Jesus, did not live a long life, but he lived a great life, a life that we are to imitate. 
We are to be in attitude and character and philosophy of life like Abel and not like Cain. My friends, let us be like Abel, humble and obedient to God and not like Cain. Let us above all be like Jesus Christ who did the will of his heavenly Father who said, And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say, Luke 6, verse 46. Those today who are not offering proper worship to God and a proper life to God are not like Abel. They are like Cain. And in the judgment, it will be very regrettable for them because they will not be found in favor with the Lord. They will be commanded to depart from the Lord. But today we have the opportunity, if there should be any here who need to come to the Lord and be like Abel, <coughs> righteous and faithful, not because we're flawless, but because we're faithful, that we are obedient to Christ, that we do the will of God, we can be like Abel and be accepted of God. If there be any need to come upon hearing and believing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, coming to repentance, Acts 2, 38, confessing Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and being baptized in His name for the remission of sins, Acts 8, 37 to 39, and Acts 2, 38, you may do that today and thereby put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27, and offer ourselves unto God and offer our bodies a living sacrifice, Romans 12 and 1. And that which is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ in His house, the church, 1 Peter 2, verse 5. If we realize as a Christian I have not really been faithful, that I have allowed my will to get involved when I should have been doing the Lord's will, that I've not been putting God first, that I've been drifting more toward Cain and his way rather than following the way of the righteous. This morning I need to return to repent and to pray God's forgiveness that I might be humble and obedient again and right with the Lord according to Acts 8, 22 to 24. Our beloved friend, we invite you to come today while we stand and we sing together. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing brow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His graces? How are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? Cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?